you know, I'm not going to be kind now. I'm going to laugh at you. <laughs> Suggesting that I wouldn't be sweet and nice. Sound like my daughters. We planted three trees this weekend. Three. Three. I don't know how far person in Adams County grew. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening's live stream. My name is John. I am the tattooed historian. And it's great to be on again with all of you. Thank you for joining us on, on the Tattooed Historian page and on the Civil War Institute page. And speaking of the Civil War Institute, I'm joined by my good friend, the director of the Civil War Institute, the man, the myth, and the legend, Dr. <laughs> Peter Carmichael. How you doing, buddy? And, oh, and I thought we should do a uh, show must go on by Queen is our thing. I don't think I know that. You don't I'm know that a big Queen fan. I, mean, oh. I, think, I think Johnny Mercury has an incredible voice. Freddie you know? Mercury? Or Eddie, see, I'm <laughs> if you were a big fan, I am. I, I, okay. But yeah, no. Uh, what's the song you did with David Bowie? Under uh, Under Pressure, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's that is truly one of the greatest songs of all time. There you go. But there's a big, then a massive drop off after that. Oh, okay. All right. We'll we'll talk about that later. <laughs> As well, before I introduce our guest tonight, I wanted to mention one of our viewers, Dr. Jenny Orr. Jenny Orr is, uh, I think she's from Altoona, but lives outside of Philadelphia. And I'm not sure how she heard about us. I think it is from one of my best friends and hairstylist, former hairstylist, Michael Freeman in State College, who, uh, and you can tell I am desperate for a Michael Freeman treatment. And if he's watching this, I'm sure he'll send me an email and complain about how I style my hair here there's not much styling just a little gel and mix it around carrie is aghast right now yeah carrie, we'll get off plus. carrie we brought you on the show so john and i could just talk about each other the entire Most time and it's quite can, entertaining i'm glad you're enjoying it <laughs> we have carrie janey of page county virginia who started her academic career at william and mary for undergrad but then switched to the university of virginia where she then not only did her undergrad, but then continued to work to her master's as well as her PhD. Uh, and then from there, she was at Purdue University, the second best state school in Indiana. And Carrie, how long were you in uh, at Purdue? For a while. 12 years. Yeah. yeah. Boiler up. Boiler and, up. Uh, did you see that their president, uh, and I've been screwing up names today, so you can give us Mitch. Did you see what Mitch said? Mitch proclaimed that Purdue was going to start this yep. August and get right back at it. There will be no online that they're going to bring the students right into the classroom. That's bold. The Indiana press did not like it. They came after him pretty hard for that, to my surprise. Uh, but uh, we won't talk about Purdue. We'll talk about what well, we can, if you like. I just want to quickly mention, we do a lot of show and tell here, uh, Carrie. A lot of visuals. It's important. Okay. We're going to talk about some of your earlier work as well, but I'd like to just let folks see it. Your very first book, right? Burying the Dead, but not the past. That was your dissertation. Again, it was. Kate Gallagher. Sorry about the glare, Carrie. But yeah, I see, I see myself in the book. You can see the book, yeah. <laughs> something about that, John. Yeah. So better lighting here. And uh, of course, <laughs> UNC Press uh, publication and another UNC Press publication. Remembering the Civil War. Hmm. And again, we have a glare issue, but if I keep moving it, people can see it. So we're going to come back to these, Carrie. Okay. Carrie, I'd like for you, you to just a little bit, a little autobiographical approach to this show. Tell us what got you interested in the Civil War. And before you get going, Carrie, you violated one of the things that John and I ask all of our guests. And that is, behind you, you're supposed to have prominently placed my books well, I don't see them anywhere do you John I don't I don't think my books are very organized by topic and I can show you precisely where all of your books are Pete over on this other wall now what do you Carrie, need me to do I, that every historian and every person watching here knows the truth you put the books that are the most important and the ones you use the most within what within arm's reach they hmm. should be right behind you let's see can you pull it let's see Yours no. are over there. There you go. <laughs> In the dark corner. I'm deeply yeah. offended by this. <laughs> we'll move on. I'll recover. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't even know what I ask. Uh, Carrie, how did you get interested in the Civil War? How to 
honestly can't remember a time I wasn't interested in the war. As you so um, prominently pointed out, I did grow up in Page County in Luray, and the war was all around me there. To, to grow up in the valley, I don't know how anyone couldn't be interested in the war. We had Newmarket Battlefield just across the mountain, um, literally just across the mountain. I grew up in the shadow of the, the, Mass, mountain, the Mass Mountain Gap. And we went to battlefield reenactments and my grandparents took me to Gettysburg and Antietam, all of those places. My mother was a, a teacher. So we went to Williamsburg and Yorktown and did all of those historic uh, type family vacations. Admittedly, when I went to college, I thought I would follow in the footsteps of my father and grandfather and go to law school. And then my fourth year, senior year at Virginia, I took a class pass fail by this guy named Ed Ayers. And that was it. That was the, the writing on the wall. And I thought this is an option. I was blissfully ignorant of the academic job market, but um, that was it when the potential. So I majored in politics undergrad. In undergrad, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. huh. Well, it's worked out uh, well for you. What I failed to mention is that she is the John now professor of civil War history at uh, the University of Virginia. And it's also the director or co-director. Director. You are the director uh, at, uh, at the now center, which does all kinds of important work uh, in our profession from um, giving scholars uh, fellowships to do work it's the Smalls Library, is that correct, or archives? The, the, the Small Library, the Special Collections Library. Great Special Collections. Uh, they also, at the University of Virginia, uh, have a range of speakers that come in that, um, of course, talk to the general public, but also work with graduate students. Mm -hmm. So for those youngsters out there, uh, of the many places to go to Civil War Air history, it's hard to imagine a better place than UVA because they have Carrie, and they also have Liz Varon, and of course you have other people in the bullpen as we speak. Carrie, I'm going to ask you a question. It's a serious one, and and I know that you think that I'm trying to set you up, and I truly am not. But I think it is important for you to talk about what it means to be a woman who works in the field of Civil War history, because although I'm not that much older than you, when I was in graduate school, there weren't there were many women. Look, did you see her rolling her eyes? Yeah, I saw that, yeah. That's right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll go back and I'll start calling you, I'll start calling myself your mentor. Someone <laughs> referred to me as her mentor, <laughs> which I liked, and I'm, I'm gonna start saying that. If you think I'm an old man, then I'll be your mentor. <laughs> so, so tell us, so what, you know, like I said, when I was in grad school, there weren't many women who were you know, in the game. In fact, it was really, to be honest with you, it was kind of Leslie Gordon, Susanna Ural was just behind her, and, and and, and right, there weren't a lot, there weren't a lot of folks. So Carrie, tell us, what does it mean to be a woman practicing in this field? Well, it's changed substantially, as you point out, even in the past 10, 15 years, in terms of um, not only how many women are in the field, but the types and ranges of things that, that women studying the Civil War are studying. It's not just studying women in the Civil War anymore many of those people that you just named and, and many, many others, Katie Shively and others are studying military history as well. And, you know, it's, it's both refreshing and it's also in some ways unremarkable that, that women should be studying the same things that, that men are. And we're just as capable and just as equipped to do the military and political history as, as anyone else. Yeah, truly a sea change in the last last 10 years in terms of how many women are at Research One institutions or other fine institutions. We had Angie Zombeck, mm -hmm. an assistant professor at UNC Wilmington. She did just a fantastic job on Civil War prisons. She was excellent. And uh, there was a really a very long list and, and no excuse now uh, that a conference related to Civil War history doesn't have women on the program. I mean, Absolutely. It's just almost inexcusable. I mean, there are some challenges still, and I know it firsthand. Um, it's still tough to find women academic scholars who can give battlefield talks that have that experience. There are more, but there's just a handful. You being one of them, Katie Shively is another, 
Um, she's, Susanna. She's a, yeah. Um, and so uh, Jennifer Murray. Yes. I mean, Jen Murray, again, is a, a, another person who's practiced in our field for a long time. She's going to be a guest on our show. Oh, great. Yeah. yeah she's working on a book for our series. Another thing uh, that I will add is that uh, Carrie and Aaron Sheehan, Dean, myself, uh, we're editors of Civil War America, which is a series published by UNC. So Jen Murray is working on a book for our series right now on George Gordon Mead, uh, which she said she's getting, I wrote her yesterday, she said she's getting warm. So hopefully by the end of the summer. Uh, <laughs> um, I just, Carrie, again, I want to say again, you know what is so gratifying is just not that there are more women practicing in our field and we can't overlook public historians. Beth Parnitska, one of my mm -hmm. former students, uh, she is going to be on the show. She's at Appomattox. Yes. Um, uh, Kathy Wright, who was really the head curator for the American Civil War Museum in Richmond. She's now in Scotland. Another one. I mean, the point is, is that, and they're not just doing women's history, yeah. right? I, which is just wonderful. I, I'll be blunt. I'd like to see the time when people of color are not expected to do history that's related to African Americans. They want to do it, fine, go to it. But I think it's unfair to place that kind of expectation. And I hope that we get a day when we can get men who feel more comfortable to be working in women's history and have a le legitimate ch chance of getting a job, right? And you work in it, uh, it's not, you're probably not going to get a job doing women's history as your specialty in the academy. I think that would be tough. Okay, we can now get to the topic at hand. Show and tell, Carrie, right? We're okay. Showing yeah. There we go. Journal of Civil War Air. We're plugging it a great deal these days. Yeah. What did we show about before? I can't even remember. Oh, oh we, it was Jack and Brownie's piece. Yeah. Jack and, Brown, Jack and Brownie did his piece on why tactical or traditional military history matters. Right. And here we have it. Terry Janey. Free to go where we liked. Lee's Army. After it's Appomattox. After Appomattox. That's the Army in Northern Virginia. After Appomattox. Sometimes you need help with titles. It's fun. Really good. <laughs> we'll help him out. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm just I'm off my game. I messed up Mercury's first name there. I can't. I'm just up to awful. But you yeah. haven't seen the movie yet? No, no, I haven't. Okay. Oh. I'm into, and I'm all serious. I'm into Polish movies on Netflix. They're fantastic. <laughs> Side note, we can talk about that later, Kate. They're quite good. Quite good. <laughs> all right. All right. So Carrie. <laughs> um John, would you like to ask the first question? I feel like I'm sort of not keeping us on track tonight. Okay. I can do it, whatever you'd like, John. Uh, whatever question I would like. Well, I'd like, I'd like to start off with something that I never even considered, Carrie, which is something that you had uh, said in, I believe in that article, uh, that journal article about the makeup of the Army of Northern Virginia at Appomattox. And you said about something that, I, like I said, I never even pondered it that roughly 20,000 of these men didn't surrender technically. And, and I found that completely fascinating because we often overlook that fact that not everybody was present at Appomattox. And it's for a variety of reasons. Now those numbers are, as you might imagine, incredibly difficult to, to get your, your hands on. But the best estimates that we have are that, that Lee had roughly 60,000 men when he pulled out of Richmond and Petersburg. And so if we take that account for the casualties that we know that both prisoners of war and uh, killed and wounded during the campaign, alongside the number of roughly 28,000 who are on the parole records from Appomattox, when you do all that math, you come up with roughly 20,000 men who are unaccounted for. There's a variety of different reasons that they were unaccounted for. And I try to tell the stories of many of these men in the, the forthcoming book. And it includes everything from those men who fall out of line, who fall out of the march along the way, men who get separated from their, their units, from their companies or regiments, and make at least a little bit of an effort to try to get back with their unit and when they can't, they throw up their hands and say, let's just go home. And then there's the cavalry. Mm -hmm. uh, the cavalry makes up the largest portion and some artillery, but the cavalry that managed to escape the Union Cordon on the morning of April 9th. But there's also a substantial number of artillery that are up at um, Red Oak Church right. that make their way out as, as well. 
that, that's so a really I, interesting point to me. I'm sorry, Pete, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, go ahead. no, but that was a really interesting point to me because I was thinking about it as uh, tying in with what we'll, we'll be going over here in a little bit, which was the actual, you know, surrender terms and how that goes into memory and such, which we can go over later. But that really was like, I was wondering if that's like the first 20,000 who either A, go home, go to a different area and say what's going on that start to say, well, we didn't surrender. And so the, the really fascinating part about this, well, there's a lot of fascinating parts. <laughs> um, I, along with a, a grad student from Purdue who did a, a lot of this work for me back in West Lafayette, um, and here I need to, to give a shout out to Trevor Plant, who has been absolutely amazing at the National Archives of helping me dig up some of these records of the paroles of men who did not surrender at Appomattox, but surrendered at countless other sites throughout Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, uh, into North Carolina. And I have a database now that has roughly 18,000 of these individual men wow. from Lee's Army. Now I'm, I'm including in that, uh, Mosby's men, for example. So men who were detached, who weren't expected to be at Appomattox. Mm -hmm. But we have all of these parole sites from Winchester to Norfolk to um, you know, little spots in the road in, in Fluvanna County, Virginia. Page where these County. men, go ahead. Page County as well, no? Um, you know, I don't think there are any surrender sites uh, in Page County. They go over the mountain to Newmarket. They go to Mount Jackson and Newmarket because Hancock is up in Winchester still, and he's sending cavalry down patrolling the main part of the valley. And when word gets out, as of April 10th, uh, Grant is, is being incredibly generous. He gets a note from Stanton that says, and this is as Grant is leaving Appomattox. He gets a, a telegram from Stanton that says, who all is included in these surrender terms? And Grant says, well, only the men that were with Lee's army, but, and here I'm pa paraphrasing, of course, but really let's be generous and let's include everyone who was attached, whether they be straggler or detached units from Lee's army, let's include them all. So Hancock starts sending out messages all up and down the valley. This happens on the Northern Neck. It happens throughout, throughout Virginia. And then it, eventually it extends into Maryland and West Virginia welcoming these soldiers if they're willing to surrender themselves so they're they're coming in sometimes they come in in groups of two or three sometimes it's the remnants of an entire regiment so you'll have 60 men mm. that march into a place like winchester together so carrie could you help us sort of understand the traditional view of lee's army breaking up at appomattox and and how that traditional view affirms what one might call a, a more reconciliationist understanding or argument about the last days of the Army in Northern Virginia. I think there's two parts to that. And part of it centers more on Grant and Lee in terms of the reconciliation and the very, I mean, the word that's used over and over, magnanimous terms that, that Grant offers that, um, you know, not accepting Lee's sword, all of these myths that have surrounded that. But then in terms of the men themselves, we hear the stories and it's portrayed in movies of individual men, or maybe one or two men straggling home by themselves. Um, this kind of war worn, weary soldier, um, thinking Ashley Wilkes, right. the most quintessential character in Gone with the Wind of making his way home all by himself. He's so dusty and, and dirt covered that people don't recognize him when he, he comes walking up. Um, but that's not exactly how these men left Appomattox. Um, what's, what was um, really striking to me were the orders that were given, the commission that meets the three Confederate and three Union generals who meet and decide on what is this gonna look like on the ground? How is this gonna play out? And one of the things that is supposed to happen are Confederate soldiers are supposed to leave alongside their units, mm -hmm. that officers are to be in charge and they're to march home. And this, this happens. They don't necessarily stay together for extended periods of time, but for several weeks, one group of soldiers heading to Southwest Virginia and into Tennessee 
stay together. They march away from Appomattox, a group of somewhere around a thousand soldiers. There are entire brigades that leave for North Carolina and South Carolina. And so they're marching away from Appomattox, many of them writing in their diaries and letters that it's much like leaving any other battlefield. It's just that they know there's not going to be another battle, or at least they believe there won't be another battle after this. So it's not the lone soldier leaving Appomattox. It's, it's much more cohesive. So does, but does that, that um, desire amongst Confederates to maintain their regimental cohesiveness, their organizations, should we then understand this? What's the big takeaway here? And are you suggesting that you, we should now see Appomattox as not the end, but it is a continuation of the war, a continuation of the war, but maybe in a new form? And, and let's be clear, what's going to be great about getting Beth Parnitska on this show, that is not the message that's often heard at Appomattox. It's certainly not the one back in the day in 1985, where the chief historian said to me that we needed to tell people that this was the moment that the country was reunited. So I'll, I'll say again, what you are suggesting is the war continued. And that's how we should understand Appomattox, but in a different form. Yes and no. Yes and no. So there, there's a couple of different levels to that. I think most of those soldiers who were at Appomattox, those Confederates who, who stayed the course and who were there to get their parole papers, to get their parole passes, to have their names on that, that parole list. Um, those men, for the most part, at least if you read what they've left us, suggests that they know that the Army of Northern Virginia is done and at least this part of the war is no more. Now, among those 20,000 men who weren't there, especially those cavalry who deliberately escaped and made plans to meet up in places like Lincoln to North Carolina and other places, they had every um, intention of resuming the fight. This is Tom Rosser, this is Tom Munford, and countless other privates who are on their way to join up with Johnston and others and continue the fight. So for them, no, Appomattox was not the end of the war. For the men who were paroled there, it's, it's a, a, a real tension between knowing that the Army of Northern Virginia has essentially been dissolved and yet their status as soldiers doesn't end immediately. That's, and this is a nuance and in a, a, a kind of a, a small argument that I'm making, but their experience as soldiers doesn't end in that moment. And I think it better helps us to better understand veterans if we understand that it's not this line in the sand that memory and, and history has led us to believe Appomattox marks. Before I turn it back over to John, just very quickly, could you just describe for us the range of, of behaviors amongst these men? Because, okay, they're not all going back in, as individuals. Yes, they maintain some of their military organization, right? Mm -hmm. And those, some of those organizations, as they get farther and farther into the South, they start to splinter apart yeah. a little bit, yes? They do. So, yes, so again, with that understanding, how did these men actually behave, right? Are they just relieved to be alive? Are they, they turn into, you know, thugs and they are terrorizing civilians? Uh, are they scheming to somehow get back at the Yankees? What's going on here in terms of behavior and emotions? All of those things. Um, I, there certainly were instances of, um, pillaging and and stealing and, and there's a lot of vigilante committees that that spring up in counties throughout Virginia and into North Carolina that are afraid of what this these disbanded soldiers what it's it's going to mean for their lives so there, there's some of that um, I think there's two stereotypes maybe I should back up here and say that there's two stereotypes that we see in movies and fiction it's either the Ashley Wilkes of the defeated lone soldier walking home, or it's these partisan bands that are, are raising hell and havoc as they just blister the countryside on their, their way home. And I, I think those are the two extremes that what we find or what I found more often was the case. Men from Virginia tended to leave in smaller groups. They were closer to home. They didn't have as far to go, but those from North Carolina, from the, um, the deep South, 
are leaving for the most part, they're marching and they're, they're talking in their diaries. Many of these diaries don't end at Appomattox. So they're, they're using the same language that they used in their wartime diaries. They talk about how many miles a day they march. They talk about rations. They talk about um, stopping at a local mill and confiscating goods because they are, they are the Confederate army and they believe they're entitled to any of the provisions that Confederate civilians have created. But there's also then, they start to splinter. The farther they get from Appomattox, they realize that it's more difficult to get food in these large numbers. So they are intentionally, there's, they're intentionally splitting up their brigade commanders that realize that they're gonna, they're gonna hold on to the parole passes, the, all those famous passes that we see of Appomattox. Right. They're not all doled out. Yeah on the field at Appomattox. Um, Grimes and others hold on to these passes until they decide to, to split up their units and then they hand them out. So there's this in, intentional notion of staying together as units and to maintaining control. And many of the officers are quite aware. Remember, they still have their sidearms. Yeah, that's right. And that's not, I don't think that's just about honor and tradition. There's also a real reason that they still have their their sidearms. What do you think, uh, Carrie, about with those surrender terms and how they're perceived by both sides really going forward? Uh, and we've heard that a, a lot of people with their opinions of they're too lenient, they're not, they don't go far enough, et cetera. And these men marching off for home, whether it's Tennessee or, or wherever, together. And it seems like there's not a clean break from the military civilian aspect of who they are now. Mm -hmm. How do you think this impacts post-war recollections like right after, right afterwards? They're, they're marching home as a military band, basically. Right, so in terms of how they're viewing, are, are you asking? How they're viewing their experience is what I mean, as far as like, how are they what viewing it? Terms meant? Yeah, in their in their in their diaries and such, how are they viewing it? If they're marching home together as a unit for the most part until they get further out, are they still seeing the causation of the reasoning for their service still marching with them? Are they still believing in such things? Because I saw there was some uh, in one of the one of the lines there was some violence against some federal troops. Mm -hmm that were done by Confederates, especially federal troops who were USCT troops. Mm -hmm. uh, All the, the Floridians that, that kill yeah. several USCT men, soldiers on their, on their way home. Not just one, but several along the way. Yeah, and I saw they got away with it right, yeah. or something like that. So that, that kind of leads me to believe that those kind of mindsets of we can still, we can, we can attack African-Americans and get away with it, or we can you know, whatever with, with this memory, it kind of stuck out to me in the writing. So I, I don't think this is exactly what you're asking, but I'm, I'm going to jump on this and then maybe we can come back to what you were sure. initially starting with. But the incident that you're talking about, um, members of the Florida Brigade, mm -hmm. that both in Virginia and when they get to uh, Georgia, kill uh, several different uh, USCT Sentinels and um, other soldiers along the way. And what I'm thinking and, and the argument that I make both in that, that journal article and in the, the larger book project is that there's a continuation, there's a through line to the way in which these men treated not only enslaved men and women, but African-American soldiers during the war. And then as we look into reconstruction that we shouldn't see quite the stark break that we think we see between the treatment of African-Americans before and after emancipation. That there's this notion that violence can be em employed or deployed against African-Americans for any reason and there won't be any retribution for doing so. The Confederate Army, Confederate government had looked the other way. They happened to get away with it on their way home from Appomattox, but then we see that violence just escalate during the post-war and reconstruction. So that's that's one of those continuities. So I, I, I'm gonna give you a little pushback here. Okay. It's not because you don't have my books behind you, but it is because the violence that the Floridians um, displayed, and there's some other examples as, as well, 
I think uh -huh. it's the of some of these small bands of Confederates taking rocks because they don't have weapons and pelting, um, I think, some former slaves. I would say that the violence is indiscriminate. And it's, it's certainly there is an intent behind it. And it's not just spontaneous. And it's not just an act of vengeance. But it's indiscriminate in a way that it could never have happened before the war and even during the war because of slavery. I mean, we see time and time again that slaveholders were always concerned about slave patrols and who, I, and who was you know, part of that patrol because they worried that those slave patrols could get a little out of hand and abuse their property. So I think the violence is very important as you brought, I think, to our attention in which people, again, that romanticized view of these men being defeated and downtrodden, and they're just gonna go home like Ashley Wilkes, and they just wanna start their lives over. That's nonsense. I think that's a great and important finding. I think, or I'd give you a little bit of pushback here, is what we start to see is a revolutionary change, right? This is emancipation. You can go after black folks now with impunity because they're in the master lording over them to say, hey, damn it, that's my property. So there's an acceleration. And so I, I mean, you're, I think you're right about indiscriminate and and, there, and there's there's no one there there aren't white people that are pushed back against it. Push back it's it's the, the big difference. I mean, would you even go so far as to suggest it's of course show and tell time again? <laughs> haven't had something for a few minutes. Here we go. I think this is a fine book. Oh yeah. Right, it's in our series, Jim Broomall. Here that one is right there. Are you kidding? Oh, see? <laughs> he's also he's also commenting in the comments too. So he's all around us right now. Yeah. And look, I, I just reach over, right? <laughs> just get your books, right? That's, okay, I'm gonna move on here. So this <laughs> book is quite good for many reasons. I really like how Jim looked at Southern men from the antebellum period, took them through the war, and mm -hmm. then looked at the immediate post-war period and the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah. And one of Jim's point is that the violence. Uh, the violent world of soldiering, uh, that these men came out of that experience and they were, what can you say, primed or prone, maybe is a better word, prone to resort to, you know, a certain viciousness uh, that they maybe would maybe showed a little bit more restraint prior to the war. Do you see, again, in your work, do you see the beginnings of the Klan? Uh, and do you see the beginnings? Yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Is this, or is that going too far, do you think? Not in what I'm working, not in this book project. I'm not saying that there aren't inklings there, um, but the beginning of the clan, no per se. I mean, the, the book, my book follows these men through the summer of 1865. And so we don't make it to, to Pulaski in 1866, but um, certainly there, that absolute hatred, that, that bubbling hatred of freedmen becomes readily apparent um, and, and well beyond just the black codes and individual soldiers talking about what it looks like to go home. Um, well, I mean, go ahead. I, well, I'm just saying, I think that you're onto something here that you know our desire and need uh, to be very specific and concrete about this began at this time, at this moment, we talk about the Klan, Pulaski, Tennessee. Maybe your book is now, and Jim as well, should cause us to rethink about the origins of the Klan rather than it being all on Nathan Bedford Forrest. And God knows, I don't wanna give that guy a break, but rather than just putting it on him at that particular moment, maybe we should see it as something that's more grassroots and more spontaneous. I mean, I don't know, I've not done the research, but maybe that's something- on to your, your larger point and thinking about uh, some of the things that the takeaways from Jim's book, I've long believed that the 1870s were probably one of the most violent and deadliest decades in American history outside of formalized warfare. Yeah, you're right. And that's, you know, all of these men, you know, union veterans that can purchase yeah. their, their rifles, their guns and, and take with them. If we think about the so-called Wild West, Native American Wars, 1870s you're right pretty yeah. violent period and carrie i'm glad that you mentioned that if you're going to think about the 1870s don't just look at the south right look west and bring mm -hmm. bring that together that's i think a, a really uh important uh, point 
There's a, a question in the comments here. It's a really good one. It's from uh, David Scar. He's watching and he says, are, are there any records of ANV parolees getting backlash or harassed by troops from either side during their journey home? Um, harassed is an uh, interesting term. There are certainly uh, many. One of the, the things I was most surprised to find were the number of paroled men who are held when they try to go into Union territory. So uh, there's uh, this is a, a big part of the story that I'm telling. The men who try to return to Northern Virginia, so Alexandria in particular, Fairfax County, to DC, to Maryland in particular, are detained by federal forces. And there's a, a huge debate among the Attorney General. Grant becomes involved. Um, Stanton becomes involved as to whether these men who left loyal territories, namely Maryland um, and West Virginia is a, a, a whole nother story, but whether these men now have homes in those loyal states. And many of them are detained for weeks at a time. And some of them even longer, um, even though they have been paroled. They're not just men who fled from, from Lee's army, but they have their papers with them. There's a great example of a man named Thomas Murray who tries to go back to Fairfax and he's learned of his father's death, but it's behind Union lines. And when he, he goes to try to cross into Fairfax County, he's immediately arrested and taken to a, a prison and held. And he's, he's taken to Alexandria into an old slave pen. And what wow. irony, maybe it's, maybe it's not ironic that a Confederate whose father had been a major slaveholder is now being detained in a building where mm -hmm. men like his father used to trade in flesh. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, Carrie, in, in thinking about this project, which we should note is um, finished, uh, it's been submitted for publication. So uh, we hopefully we'll see it in less than two years, right? Oh, oh hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Right. We never know with, again, this economy and how things are going to bounce around, but it's certainly been a few years, right? And this book, Remembering the Civil War, and I, I'm just, you know, not that you need me to plug your work, but you know, I think that this is a book that's a must read in tandem with David Blight's Race and Reunion. And while there's much that these books share, and Carrie, I think, is quick to acknowledge and point out the strengths of Race and Reunion, and she takes a very different path, especially when it comes to how Northern soldiers, Union veterans, how they made a real distinction between reunion and reconciliation. That is worth the price of the book, which is, is again, it's a beautiful book. Uh, I'm just curious again, how this current project fits within your broader thinking, uh, on really on the sort of grandest terms. Mm -hmm. you know, I want our audience to think about, you know, how should we frame Reconstruction and reconciliation. How does this project in Appomattox, how does it figure in, if it does at all, within your conclusions and findings in this book? Yeah, so in some ways, they're projects of opposite scale. So remembering looks at the war through roughly 1939, through Gone with the Wind. Big picture examination of how black and white, men and women, unionists, Confederates grappled with what the war meant and how that meaning changed over time and how they would use it for social and political, um, as a social or political tool. I, the chapters that I, that I really began with and were twice as long as they became in remembering were those early chapters. I think I've always been drawn to that. I mean, in Bearing the Dead too, is you know 1865 1866 is, is the starting point and I've always really been intrigued and find that period of ending not just the American Civil War but civil wars how do they come to a conclusion I, I kept coming back to that period and so the current book project it doesn't differ strikingly I don't think in terms of the the message of of remembering, but I'm really drilling down into taking things day by day, week by week. And instead of looking at several decades, 
I'm looking at a couple of weeks and months yeah. and how ideas and ideologies and attitudes and reactions could pivot in a moment. Yeah. And the, the ways, the uncertainty, I think that's the, the, the thing that I have enjoyed most about this project is we think we know this narrative. We think we know this story. There's Appomattox, Lincoln's assassination, the trial of Lincoln's assassins, a tightening and then a, 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 le um, a lessening by Johnson and then we have radical reconstruction. But if you slow down the pace, if you slow down the narrative to use a Ayersian term, there's all of these moments of contingency, all of these moments when things might have been slightly different or dramatically different. Yeah, I was thinking again, Ayers, uh, the, uh, the person that had that impact on you at UVA to become a history major. I think he also though, and it's a good piece, although I have to chuckle a little bit, he calls it not just contingency, he calls it what, doesn't he call it double? Deep, deep contingency. Deep contingency. <laughs> it reminds me of, of Animal House when uh, they're on double information, <laughs> <laughs> which means nothing. And deep contingency, I mean, I love Ayers' work. And, you know, if I could create, you know, even an article that would have a quarter of the impact of the stuff that he's done, I would have a, a happy career. But uh, the deep contingency thing I found to be kind of uh, amusing, actually. But the contingency thing is, is, is very important. Um, Carrie, I'm thinking now about our friend and co-editor, Aaron Sheehan Dean mm -hmm. and his book, Calculus of War, which is close by as well. I guess I should pull it off the shelf here. I showed it last week. Not on camera. A bit of a stretch. <laughs> and, uh, Calculus of Violence. There you go. And Aaron's going to come on the show soon as well. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that you know Aaron is fairly persuasive about is the the attempt to try to control and contain violence on both sides, um, that there were moments that it seemed to spiral out of control and that we have often, as historians, we've seen those moments when violence had spiraled out of control and we have failed to appreciate or to understand that it was really an attempt on moderation. Now, I think Aaron, and I think he would also agree, that he rides pretty, he rides pretty heavily on Mark Grimsley's hard hand of war. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. and there, there certainly was always this attempt, even when um, union policies deployed uh, hard violence, right? What we might call a policy of exhaustion. We, even when they did that, there was always an attempt to try to contain and control that violence. So I ask you now, as we look at the very end of the war, and again, I think what you've told us tonight, let's not look at Appomattox as the sharp end, right? We need to open up uh, this window a little bit, uh, look at those months that followed Appomattox, and what do we see here in terms of violence? The violence that these veterans, that they were willing to continue to use, whether it be against Blacks, maybe against some Northern soldiers if possible, or against Southern civilians. Does your findings, does it fit within this book at all? So in, in a couple of ways, and um... For what it's worth, Pete, Aaron's book is right over here beside your book. <laughs> right. I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just accept that that's true. <laughs> I think as much as, I, I didn't find the extent of violence against the home front, against civilians, as one strain of historiography suggests that these Confederates were looting soldiers. There's absolutely the instances that, that I, we've already talked about with the African-American soldiers. There are certainly, um, there's certainly men that are taking mostly food. That's, I mean, and that, that's not excusable. The thing that, that's really interesting is um, in Danville and Greensboro, the, the riots that happen or the, the food that's taken it's, it was shocking to me how many Confederate civilians said it wasn't right and they shouldn't have done that, but we understand why they did because they needed food. So and they you, needed very quickly, give us that description. When did this riot occur in Greensboro and who's a part of it? So you know this date probably better than I do off the top of my head, but it's what, April 26th? 
Yeah, that might even be a little late, I think. I'd have to look it up, but it's- I mean, it's it's as the bulk of Lee's army is moving through. Johnston's army is surrendered. Right. right. So they've so it's a mixing of Lee's men and Johnston's men, I believe. Yes, absolutely. And there's already been instances of this at Danville. There's been an explosion at Danville when a, a railroad, when an engine um, blew up and several people had died during that. In Greensboro, they are targeting government Confederate warehouses and taking goods. It happens again in Charlotte. So it's if you can imagine the soldiers slowly making their way, and of course splintering off as they go. But as these groups of men come into these towns where they expect to find provisions, they're taking and looting or whatever other verb you want to use to describe it. Yeah. But overwhelmingly, Southern diarists, Confederate sympathizing diarists and newspapers excuse the behavior because they say, these are soldiers who have fought on our behalf. They shouldn't have done this, but they were hungry. They were desperate. That's why they do these things. So that violence isn't directed at individual people so much as survival. And I'm, I'm, I'm not excusing it either. I'm just trying to explain why it happened. But in terms of getting back to Aaron's book, I think there is a there is a sense of measuring, of controlling that officers that stay with these large groups of men are very concerned and are constantly giving them orders. You are not to harm civilians, you know, take what you need in terms of provisions, but you're not going to harm anyone along the way. So there is this calculus, if you will. The other really important point that I'll make, though, is that Grant and Sherman were both extremely worried about guerrillas and partisan warfare. They were almost, Sherman, almost obsessed with the fact that these disbanding armies are going to lead to widespread partisan warfare. And so this is Grant's real reason for wanting to parole all of the men that he does. At first he says, for example, Mosby's men can't be paroled. And then he very quickly says, you know what? We don't want any more guerrilla warfare. We don't need any more of that type of violence. Let's parole as many Confederate soldiers as we possibly can and end this war. So it is ever on his mind of this, this fear. Now, I'm, I'm not saying it was that it was happening, but this fear, this impending notion that it could all dissolve into the, the type of, of partisan backwoods warfare that, that Lee is trying to prevent. And they'd be fools not to worry about that because the extensiveness of guerrilla warfare, which so many excellent scholars, I won't start listing names, I'll list leave people out. But it really did begin with Dan Sutherland, I think, yeah. in his work. But you know, I'm shocked. Uh, I was shocked to find how much guerrilla warfare was occurring south of Petersburg. Mm -hmm. You're so focused, or I'm always so focused on the siege lines, but you didn't have to go very far south from the Union positions, and you had a real mess on your hands there as well. John, I was going to turn over to what kinds of either, John, you have a question, or do we have any of our viewers that have any questions? For I, had a, I had a question uh, that popped up earlier about uh, the knowledge of Reconstruction historical memory, and it ties into one of your earlier works, Carrie, and it, it was concerning how important it is, how important is it for someone who's studying the Civil War to also understand Reconstruction as far as historical memory is concerned? Well, it's the short version is it's absolutely critical. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is because the Confederate memory, the lost cause is ever driven by the memory of Reconstruction both the actual lived experience for white Southerners, as well as the memories that they craft and the stories that they tell. And it's really important to keep in mind that the United Daughters of the Confederacy, which officially organized in 1894, mm -hmm. overwhelmingly were born during the war or after the war. So they came of age during reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And that is their lived experience. And much of what they write and what they have to say talks about the Yankee atrocities after yeah. Appomattox. Mm -hmm. So we, I think we often uh, glance past that and focus on what they have to say about the war, but much of, of their vitriol and rhetoric is grounded in thinking about Grant's barbarity as a reconstruction president 
and they don't they're not always explicit in that but much of what they have to say about grant in particular has to do with reconstruction and not the war that overrides the magnanimous surrender at appomattox doesn't that also uh prove that historical memory is fluid just depending <laughs> on what you need to do at the time to get your story across and and what whatever you can do to put your head down at night to think about you know what your ancestors may have done or any, whether it was here in, on this continent or any other continent it's fluid and it's a box you can pick from you pick out the pieces that you need and plug them in wherever yeah. it might work yeah because i know i had world war one ancestors in germany and i'm sure i'm not happy with what they did in belgium but it's just you know you, you don't think about historical memory in that way my historical memory is i forget about them <laughs> you know uh, but i've always i've often thought that that it's just so it's like gumby you just twist and turn it whatever the need is at the moment in many cases with historical memory right yeah. yeah so john if we don't have any i have a certain other question for gary sure. do you have yeah. any questions so for many of our viewers if we don't i'll go with mine go with yours and I'll, I'll look through the comments pete and we'll see what we got so you know carrie again i'm struck by your findings and and i'm also again i just a side note shocked that, that none of us have really thought about the immediate aftermath of the breakup of Lee's army, that no one's looked at demobilization, and not just of the army in Northern Virginia, but of other Confederate armies as well. So, you know, this is, again, important spade work, I think, that you have done. And I think that you've also connected it to some really big and important questions. And I'm glad that John has reminded our audiences of that linkage between the war years and Reconstruction, that that divide, that, you know, we often, it often occurs even when we teach Civil War and Reconstruction that, uh, that I think that you're breaking down some important barriers. But one of the other big questions is about American exceptionalism, which within, or I should say among academics, uh, there's almost party uniformity when it comes to this issue. For anyone to suggest, to even hint that the US experience was exceptional or different from what was occurring in the rest of the globe. It, it almost it, it gets you banished, right, from, from, from the profession. Uh, and you know, I think that that's a problem. I do get why people are uncomfortable with exceptionalism because when it's often used, it's a way to elevate the US as somehow, not just being different, but being superior. And so I get that. But I think that there's distinct national and distinct regional histories. And I don't think that those national and regional histories are often connected to a broader globe. Although again, I'm not against the globalization of US history. I think that's important. So I say all that to try to, obviously I'm trying to take some shelter here to this point that I'd like for you to comment on. I think that what you've said to us tonight, and when I link that with Aaron Chi and Dean's book, I can't help but to conclude still that the ending of the American Civil War was exceptional and different from what one would typically expect and what one would find in other civil wars across the globe. Now, Kerry makes a great point. The 1870s is a bloody decade in the US. But the immediate aftermath is what I'm speaking about. And Kerry, what you've not said to us today, because I don't think you found the evidence, because I don't think it's there. And that's these Confederate outfits. Though they don't have weapons, their officers do. We don't see them in any way trying to terrorize African Americans in a, what I'd say, a systematic, planned, and organized way. We don't see them terrorizing Southern civilians. And we certainly don't see them trying to create guerrilla bands, right? I don't see anybody saying, you know what, the hell with this, let's get into the mountains of upcountry South Carolina and we will eventually get weapons and we'll eventually get horses and we will eventually continue this struggle. We see none of this. And then above all else, what we don't see is anyone getting the noose. Well, wow. getting shot. We don't see right that any of that. So how is it? I'm sorry, I've now made my case. And I'm, again, what you think about this, if we want to understand the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, we are on solid ground if we go comparatively to see that we are exceptional and different, not better just different. And that's well, and I think so much of that, and here I'm going to lean on Andy Lang a bit, because I think his work looking at um, the U.S. 
and how the, the United States and the Union in particular perceived itself during and after the war, that those in the Union in particular absolutely thought that they were exceptional and they proceeded and behaved as such. And I think part of that was grounded in law. And I, one of the things that this book became, I'm not a legal historian, but it became more and more a story of the, the legal battles that were happening in the aftermath of a civil war. And part of it is many in the, the North and the, the Union feel that their hands are tied in terms of how they can respond because of the constitution, because of international law. And so whether that makes it an exceptional end, they certainly are justifying it as such. Can you just go back just a little bit and rewind? First of all, can you tell us Andy Lang's book title? I don't you... know, because it's the new one. Oh, it's the one that he did with- um, Mike Parrish. Michael Parrish. Yeah. Either it's LSU. But his book on military- I don't think it's out yet. It's not. But his book on military occupation, though. Yes. Right. But can you tell us about how does military occupation, because that's not just a wartime, obviously, phenomenon. It's also post-war. He dealt with the wartime issues. But doesn't the wartime issues of military occupation, doesn't it help us then appreciate why the post-war period played out as it did? That you have Grant and Sherman saying to Hancock, hey, and to Stanton, invite any Confederate you can, bring them in, let's get them a pass, let's make them civilians, right? And where does that again originate? Well, it originates obviously during the war, I think. Yeah, I, I think that's Grant and Lincoln. And Grant, I, I came away from this project thinking even more highly of Grant yeah, than, than I ever did. That he is always interceding on behalf of, of Confederates in an effort to end the war. He is repeatedly saying, I, I don't agree with what they're fighting for, what they fought for. I don't, you know, I, I, I don't want to promote this, but here are the things that I promised at Appomattox. And, you know, one of the things that, that, that we also take for granted is that, that Lee isn't tried for treason, that he and, and roughly 36 others, they're indicted in June of 65. That doesn't go away. People think that goes away when Grant goes to Johnson. It doesn't go away for several years. That is lingering. And Lee is responding to that. And even a year later, when he wants to go to North Carolina to visit the new headstone for his daughter who died during the war, he has, um, he has Rooney write, actually it's complicated, but Rooney writes to Grant and says, can we go? Our paroles say that we can't leave our homes. And we're <laughs> under indictment. Yeah, I didn't know that. That's interesting. But Lee, let's be honest, Lee's inter he's lucky in the end, they didn't send him to a gulag in Wisconsin or some, God, or Canada. That's John's favorite place. <laughs> they didn't go to Canada. And say, you're sending me, you're sending me to Canada. What are you trying yeah, to say? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the other great what might have been, right. we also take for granted that, that Grant was going to parole all of these men. Mm -hmm. We need to look only at the Revolutionary War. And here I'll give a shout out to my former colleague and dear friend at Purdue, uh, T. Cole Jones, and his book on prisoners of war and the revolution to know that all those men that surrendered, those British soldiers that yeah. surrendered at Yorktown, yeah. they don't get to go home. They no, don't get no. paroled. They get sent to prisoner of war camps for several years. Oh God, I didn't know that, that could have happened too. Yeah, absolutely. So we shouldn't take for granted right. how the war plays out. Right, but we should in fact note where it's distinct and different from other civil wars. And I don't know why we can't take some, again, I don't know how I feel about it. Is this again, Carrie, I'm curious. If I were one of your students and I were to say to you, you know what? Dr. Janey, I, I take pride in the fact that my country ended the Civil War in a relatively peaceful way. I know that the war kept going on. I know issues were not resolved. I know that there was violence directed against African Americans. I know it was horrible and bloody, but the end created a platform in which there could be a long-term peace. I'm proud of my country. What would you say to me? I'm I would actually ask them to, to slow down the narrative again and tell me when that moment came, when they were convinced. An undergrad, man, I'm just, I got- I, I just had this conversation that. with an undergrad, Pete. They can handle it. Yeah, I can. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you mean by slow it down? I'm saying to you that I am pleased to see and that 
1865 to 66 period, I think the country did not uh, collapse into guerrilla warfare in the South. And it's got a presence, but I'm, that is, I think, something that Americans, that we should take pride in. I'm, I'm gonna give so much credit here to, to Grant. I, I really think that, that he is holding back so much of the, the vengeance and vitriol that, that a fair number of at least Republicans in the North wanted to unleash on Confederate leaders. Yeah, I mean, I get it, again, as you know, I was in a sense role playing here. And I don't know what I'd say to a student about that because I do know this. I think that our students need to find in the American past things to believe in, that they need to see that people who had power, though not perfect, that like Grant could do decent things. Mm -hmm. I think it's troubling to me that we're so quick to tear people down. I, Kevin Levin's gonna be on our show. I'm gonna ask him, is the Grant Monument next that he would wanna take down? Because it appears anything that's related or connected to the Confederacy in his eyes at least, needs to go down or he'll say local communities should decide. But then Kevin goes and says, no, and he's being Confederate, right? Just sort of be scrubbed off. So I ask you, does Grant next? Because all you gotta do is look at Grant's policies out West. I'd say not so humane and not so decent. I think, again, I say all this, not just to be provocative. I say all this because it's, it's tough questions, but tough questions that we have to think about in terms of our younger generation and, and how, they, how they see the past and how I want them to have some hope for the future. And I would add that we shouldn't wallow and we shouldn't adorn ourselves with what um, um, Robert Penn Warren called the treasury of virtue. Yes, that's and this notion that there is a, a virtuous past that we can somehow wrap ourselves in, that we need to confront the past with all of its, its warts and ugliness yeah. and look it in the eye and say, we can do better and we can learn from this rather than let's not talk about that because that was ugly. Absolutely. Right. And pretend that we had no connection or relationship to it. Because right now you have no idea that the North, right, was absolutely indispensable to the production of cotton and institution of slavery. I mean, you'd have no idea now. It was if the South existed an island into itself, which is something that's going to be fun uh, to talk to Kevin about as well. John, do we have any final questions from our viewing audience? Uh, well, Kevin is in the comments. He says he can't yeah. wait to get that question. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to. I, I feel like the, I, I feel like the stat guy on the sports things. I looked up uh, Andrew Lang's book. It's uh, American Civil War in the World: Limited War, Limited Peace. When's that coming out? That's coming out this year, according to uh, uh, his CV. Uh, also, there was a really good question about, that I wanted to ask real quick uh, from Chris uh, Schumacher. He asked, what kind of infrastructure was in place to facilitate the movement of these parolees? Well, if any. <laughs> yeah, so that is a, a long, drawn out um, conversation. The oh. short version is there's no infrastructure in place at first. This is a um, one of the, the, the whole disbanding, the whole ending of the war is a let's try this and see how it works. Oops, that didn't work. Let's try this. Mm -hmm. And Grant gives the, the special orders number 73 as he's leaving Appomattox that says that the men can pass through the lines and use government transportation when necessary to reach their homes through the lines, mm -hmm. which he ends up eventually explaining. And, and he says that he gets incredibly irritated when Ord, who's uh, in charge of Richmond, keeps sending all of these Confederate soldiers to Baltimore and New York. They're putting them on steamers at City Point and sending them up to, to Maryland and New York. And Grant is just absolutely beside himself and said, that is not what I meant. What I meant was if they need to pass through union lines and occupied portions of the South, they can do so. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a lot of this back and forth. So they are um, sometimes traveling by steamer. Men are going to City Point and getting on steamers to go to Savannah or elsewhere to, to Galveston, to New Orleans. Um, they are sometimes traveling by rail this happens especially immediately after Appomattox. They go to Burkeville, which is the closest uh, railroad connection to Appomattox to take the trains down to City Point. Some of them are very short passages. Some of them are longer. 
Um, the problem is that many of these paroled Confederates increasingly become to believe they're entitled to union transportation. And this creates some conflicts. They show their parole pass and the local commander in the area will say, I don't care, I'm not honoring that. So it's all happening on a very individual localized level as much as a big level. Hmm. One more point, when they're coming into places like Baltimore, Baltimore is exceedingly interesting. Um, Lou Wallace hmm. of Ben-Hur fame, yeah. uh, Indiana, mm -hmm. back to that Pete. Um, <laughs> Lou Wallace is in control in Baltimore, and he is livid, especially in the aftermath of the assassination, that all of these Confederates are coming to his city. And so he sends out the provost marshal and says, every time one of them steps off a boat, you arrest him and you haul him into the city jail. The jails are filled in Baltimore of all of these men who thought they were being, they get on a union steamer to go home and then they get detained wow. when they get to Baltimore. So again, there's, there's even more to that story. Well, Carrie, we're going to look forward to seeing it in print. It'll be a UNC, UNC book in a few years. Again, here's Carrie's two other volumes. They are uh, going down to my book annex after this in the basement. Uh, that's Understood. Great. So, good. so Carrie, uh, thank you again. John, yes, we have you. on Thursday, we have Zach Fry. We do. Zach Fry, uh, PhD from... Ohio State, he published this book in our series. And when I say our, Carrie and Aaron, Republic, Republic in the Ranks. Oh, I think Carrie's getting her copy. Are you yeah. Look at that. I'm the odd man out again. Well, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll get you a copy. It's a fantastic book. He is one hell of a historian. So we're eager to see Zach on Thursday night at seven o'clock. Yes, that's awesome. gonna be great. All right, John, take good care of yourself. You too, Carrie. Carrie, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank tell, you so much, Carrie. Tell Spence and Cam I said hello. All right. And, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Pete. Thank you, thank you uh, everyone, for tuning in and all the questions. I'm sure we'll have to go back through them over the next two days or so and, and answer quite a few of them. But tune in on Thursday for our next discussion. Have a great night, everybody. Take care of yourself.